Today we'll be demonstrating an ankle and foot examination. And to start off, we'll be discussing lateral ankle sprains. Now, in all athletic injuries, ankle sprains make up about 40% of those injuries. And of that 40%, 85% tend to be lateral ankle sprains or inversion sprains as they're called. Now, many people will actually suffer recurrent lateral ankle sprains. And primarily, when we see that in individuals, it can be as high as 40% of those who have had an ankle sprain. You'll see that they're actually recruiting muscles differently and they have difficulty activating muscles in their ankles, knees, and hips during activity. So quite a significant injury. Now, the first part of the examination will be palpation. So let's palpate some key anatomical structures that are involved in injuries. Starting out, we're gonna look at three main ligaments here on the lateral aspect of the ankle. We'd look at the anterior talofibular ligament, the ATFL, which runs in this direction. We'd also look at the calcaneal fibular ligament, which runs this way. And then the posterior talofibular ligament, the PTFL, which runs posterior at a slight angle. Now, thinking of these three ligaments, the most commonly injured one would be the ATFL. Secondly would be the CFL, the calcaneal fibular ligament, and lastly but not very often would be the PTFL. If the CFL and the ATFL ligaments were damaged, that would create considerable instability in the ankle. And that occurs with a plantar flexed, adducted, and slightly supinated uh, position, meaning an inversion ankle sprain. Now, another thing to think of in this type of injury would be potential damage to the superficial peroneal nerve, which runs through this area. And with that inversion sprain, you can get a tractional type of injury. Two other points to make would be looking at the peroneus longus and brevis muscles. As they run down, those tendons run right behind the lateral malleolus and down towards the foot. So as that were to be inverted, you could actually damage the tendons and muscle fibers. And one thing to note is a lot of the times in the recovery stage after an injury, you'll actually find that those tendons could subluxate or kind of move out of their proper position. So those are the key landmarks that we're looking at when examining the ankle. Now, regarding the lateral ankle sprain, there's two tests I'd like to cover. The first one being the anterior drawer test, and that's going to test the ATFL, the anterior talofibular ligament. So to perform that test, I'm gonna stabilize the lower limb here, and I'm gonna grab from the back of the foot, and I'm trying to create movement in this direction to stress that ligament and see if it's been damaged. So we're gonna see if there's any translation. There we go. Good. So the second test is looking at the calcaneofibular ligament here, the CFL. And that one is a forced inversion test. So we're going to stabilize the leg once again, and we're creating inversion. And as you can see here, we're really stretching out the ligament. There we go. So, And now one thing to mention is when performing this, we're looking for laxity, the end feel, to see if there's any resistance or decreased resistance. If we suspect that something has occurred here, we always want to compare to the non-symptomatic side to gauge the two and see what the differences are. So very important when doing these tests, always look at both sides. Now let's discuss a condition that is commonly related to a lateral ankle sprain, and that is cuboid syndrome. So what exactly is cuboid syndrome? It basically involves the cuboid, and in 7% of people who have suffered a lateral ankle sprain, they'll also suffer cuboid syndrome. In the dance community, that exponentially increases, especially in ballet dancers, up to about 17% of dancers will suffer this. So what exactly is it? We're looking at the cuboid bone, and basically when the ankle goes into an inversion type sprain, sometimes this cuboid will actually shift from its normal position and it gets stuck within its range of motion and it can be quite painful. Common symptoms would be pain either above or below the cuboid, lateral foot pain. Sometimes you'll get pain along the peroneal tendons right here. And you'll notice it especially in toe off or plantar flexion during the normal gait cycle or sometimes with impact. So it's definitely a condition that you wanna consider with a lateral ankle sprain. Now, if we suspect cuboid syndrome, there's two tests we're gonna perform. One being the mid-tarsal adduction test, 
And the second one is the mid-tarsal supination test. So starting out with the adduction test, we're gonna stabilize the joint and the subtalar joint here, the ankle, and we're gonna create adduction, adduction in a transverse plane. So like this. So this is the mid-tarsal adduction test to do it one more time. So once again, it's adduction in the transverse plane. Now the second one, we're basically gonna create supination. So we're stabilizing the limb. We're gonna create plantar flexion, adduction, and inversion. So we're starting out and we're creating supination of the foot. And this is the mid-tarsal supination test. There we go, good. Now the next thing I'd like to do is assess the talar dome. So we're gonna use the lateral malleolus here as a landmark, dropping into this little recess or depression right here, and we're gonna palpate the talar dome, and we can move the foot into a bit of plantar flexion and, and dorsiflexion, and just palpate that surface of the dome, looking for any tenderness, uh, which would be indicative of osteochondral defects. So that is a simple palpation of the talar dome. Now let's assess the base of the fifth metatarsal for possible fracture. Anecdotally, we had a patient this year that suffered an inversion sprain, stepping down from one step onto a power cord, and it elicited extreme pain and tenderness in this area, and she was unable to walk. So you wouldn't think that an injury like that would cause a fracture, but yet we sent her for x-rays and it did confirm a fracture. So that's something to think about. When assessing the fifth metatarsal, the base of the fifth metatarsal, we're gonna palpate it, see if we can elicit pain. And if you do suspect that, you know, based on the tenderness and presentation of the patient that there could be a fracture, this would be worth sending out for an x-ray. Next, we'll assess for syndesmosis damage. And what the syndesmosis is, it's the fascial connections between the tibia and the fibula, so between the two bones. It's that connective tissue that binds them together. The first test is the external rotation test. So we're gonna dorsiflex the foot, just gonna stabilize the leg, and we're creating external rotation, seeing if we elicit any pain between the fibula and the tibia. The second test is the squeeze test. So we're gonna stabilize the leg, put pressure on the fibula and the tibia, and we're gonna squeeze them together. And once again, looking for a painful response. So that is two tests assessing for syndesmosis damage, the squeeze test and the external rotation test. Now let's assess the Achilles tendon. Think about the tendon to begin with though, it's the strongest and longest tendon in the human body, and it can withstand forces of up to 1,100 pounds. The tendon itself is formed uh, it's a co-joint tendon, meaning that it's a combination of the two gastrocnemius muscles, the deeper soleus muscle. They come together and they taper down to form the Achilles tendon here. And when we think about the mechanics of the lower extremity, basically when you activate those muscles and plantar flex the foot in toe-off or push-off during gait, that force is being transmitted through that Achilles tendon. If we think of the fascial connections, the gastrocnemius and soleus and the hamstrings actually connect to each other. There's an interwoven uh, type of connection back of the knee. And if we follow that up, we can even think of the gluteal muscles because statistically with ankle sprains, there's usually an altered firing pattern in the glutes. And if the glutes aren't firing properly, that load will be transferred to the hamstrings. As the hamstrings contract and tighten, they're going to affect the gastrocnemius muscles and the soleus indirectly, which will cascade down into altered mechanics in that Achilles tendon. So always think of that kinetic chain. No matter what the injury is, you always have to think above and below and what other structures may be affected. Now to assess the Achilles tendon, we're going to start off with just a visual inspection. We're looking, you know, is there any swelling, bruising, any visible defects? and we're going right into palpation. So we're gonna start visualizing where those calf muscles meet. We're gonna to start to palpate the length of the tendon from both sides. And as we get down towards the calcaneus, just about where it inserts, we're gonna look for any tenderness on either side. This could be an indication of bursitis. 
Now the second test would be a calf squeeze. So having palpated the tendon, now we're actually gonna squeeze the musculature of the calf and we should see the foot plantar flex. And that is telling us that that tendinous connection is intact. If this were to be diminished or decreased, we would think potentially a rupture or some type of complex tear. Now a note to make here is that there's really poor blood supply to the tendon. And that's one of the primary factors of why it's such a difficult area to rehabilitate and treat. And if it's not addressed properly, this is one of those injuries that can come back and recur and cause further problems down the road. So it's essential that you really take your time assessing this and once again, compare the two sides to make sure of any defects or possible injury. Now there's two things I'd like to discuss regarding the metatarsals. The first being a Morton's neuroma, and the second is a stress fracture of the second metatarsal. When we think Morton's neuroma, we're talking about the web spaces, those interdigital spaces here where the nerves come through. Most commonly, we'll see it between maybe the second and third. It could occur between the third and fourth. In reality, it could really occur between any of them. So in order to test this, what we're going to do is squeeze the metatarsal heads together, performing a basic click test. Sometimes you'll hear an audible click or feel a click. If there's a painful response, patient tells you that it hurts, that would be considered positive. So here we go. We're going to basically squeeze the heads together. Okay, so that would be the click test. And then assessing for the metatarsal stress fracture, looking at the second metatarsal here, during the gait cycle, there's a considerable amount of force that comes through the first and second metatarsals. And the second one here is more susceptible to stress fractures. So to show you, I'm just gonna plant or flex the toe here and kind of push through. So here would be the head of the second metatarsal. So we're just gonna get in there and palpate from above and below and kind of palpate the length of that metatarsal. Once again, if this elicits pain, patient gives you some feedback, you could suspect a fracture. If you truly suspect that there is a stress fracture, we recommend that you x-ray this. Now, the next condition I'd like to discuss during the ankle and foot examination is plantar fasciitis. And in order to assess that, we're gonna perform two tests. The first one is direct palpation of the origin of the plantar fascia at the medial anterior tubercle of the calcaneus. So if you palpate and apply pressure here, and this is painful, then that would be positive for plantar fasciitis. The second test is performing big toe or first toe hyperextension, which is gonna create the windlass mechanism. So we push this into extension all the way to end range. You can see this tightening up. If this causes pain along the plantar fascia or at the origin here, that would also be considered a positive test for plantar fasciitis. Now, one thing to think about when treating plantar fasciitis is the greater kinetic chain. So uh, Lindsay, have you bend this knee and straighten out the other leg for a sec? It'd be a little easier to see. So remember, the gastrocnemius muscles and soleus come together to form that co-joined tendon, the Achilles tendon. Tension in the calf muscles will directly translate through the Achilles and there's connections directly into the plantar fascia. If we look even further up, I would assess the hamstrings and the gluteal muscles once again. That whole kinetic chain can directly impact the kinetic, uh, sorry, the plantar fascia. And one thing to not forget is actually look at the antagonist muscles. Because even though we may find restrictions here and here, we really need to look at muscles like the tibialis anterior, for example. If there's enough tension there or restriction, you're gonna have a reciprocal action on the opposite side, which will impact the foot. So once again, always thinking bigger picture, look at the entire kinetic chain. Now there's one other condition I'd like to discuss, and that is bunions or hallux valgus. So bunion, when we look at the foot just upon visual inspection, we would see a deviation of the toe like this, or a bony outgrowth just right here, a hallux valgus deformity. And when we think of bunions, there's a lot of underlying factors. So obviously think of foot uh, wear, basically shoes, pointy shoes, uh, ballet shoes if you're dancing on point, cowboy boots. Those will have a direct impact on the formation of a bunion. In cultures where the people don't wear shoes, we won't see bunions. So another factor that we'll also see is if someone walks with the foot in a kind of an external position like this, rotated, it's gonna put a lot of stress 
on this part of the foot as it pronates and moves, stressing that abductor hallucis and adductor hallucis muscles. Those are all contributing factors to a bunion. If we have low arches, flat feet, hypermobility, or problems in that kinetic chain, they will predispose someone to the formation of a bunion. And in the dance community, it's almost a guarantee. You'll see this on, on practically every dancer that we treat here at the clinic. Now, to assess the bunion or hallux valgus deformity, we're basically doing palpation and ranges of motion. So we're gonna find the first metatarsal phalangeal joint right here, and we're gonna put the toe into flexion, we're gonna bring it into extension. We're doing some internal and external rotation, as well as valgus and varus stresses here on the joint. And what I'm feeling for is crepitus, any clicking, popping, any tenderness or decreased mobility. And so while you're doing this, keep communicating with the patient so that they'll let you know. So once again, just assessing that toe and of course, to state the obvious, the visual inspection, just, you know, if you do see that deformity, that pretty much will confirm that there's something going on. Now, there's one more point I'd like to make regarding bunions, and that is that we may not be able to reverse the bunion, but in most cases, we can treat the bunions. And we can get the patient to a point where they're functional and in reduced pain, and they can pursue the things they like. So, we've actually made a video on bunions. If you're interested, we're going to put the link up in a card in the corner of the video here. Please check it out. And that concludes the ankle and foot examination. Please check out our other examination videos and thank you for watching.